Yeah, the story's good and all, but why did this have to be a game? Shouldn't it have just been made a movie? This is probably the most common critique I see about The Last of Us, and games that focus on a more cinematic style in general. Sometimes it's an argument that's made in good faith by critics who bristle at the game's more linear nature and yearn for more direct control over authoring their own experience. And those are some pretty fair complaints. But I've also seen this line of thinking used to devalue this style of game in the same way titles like Gone Home or Dear Esther get labeled as walking simulators or quote unquote not really games because they go against the grain of how we have traditionally defined a video game over time. Where I think both these kinds of criticisms come from is a mindset that was established in the early to mid 2000s. Around this time, technology had developed to a point that games could use higher fidelity pre-rendered cutscenes to tell stories in ways that video games never could before. Ideally, this would lead to a unique blend of interactive gameplay and traditional filmic style to create an experience that's more engaging for the player. But because these were still early days for game designers, what you got more often than not were long segments of gameplay that sometimes only loosely had to do with the game's plot, and a smattering of cutscenes to stitch the gameplay sequences together. Because these cutscenes were used as both a reward for completing a gameplay section and the primary vehicle for advancing a narrative, critics started looking at storytelling in games as a strict binary of gameplay versus story. But as designers have learned and grown over time, their ability to mesh these two aspects of games has greatly improved. But the problem is, the way we think and talk about games hasn't always kept that same pace. It's from this perspective that cinematic games like The Last of Us get the reputation that they are overly reliant on cutscenes to tell their story. A false equivalency gets established that if a game doesn't take full advantage of what makes the medium unique, in this case interactivity, then that game is therefore of lesser quality than a game that does. Not only do I just strongly disagree with this line of thinking in general, but in the case of The Last of Us, it's a very reductive and often outright misinterpretation of how it tells a story over the course of the game. So I want to take a closer look at the ways The Last of Us blends the active nature of games and the passive elements of film, and specifically point out three techniques it uses to convey and enhance the emotional relationships between its characters and the player. Although I usually try to avoid summarizing too much of the actual plot of a game I'm covering, after numerous rewrites of this script, I couldn't really find a better way to point out these different techniques and to go over them as they come up chronologically in the story. So if it's been a while since you played The Last of Us, and you've forgotten some of it, well, good news, you don't have to replay to enjoy this video, but bad news is there's going to be a bit more narration than usual from me dedicated to just recapping the plot. So with that short disclaimer out of the way, let's begin. So this is Joel, and he's going to be one of the two main characters we follow along with in this game. When we first meet Joel, he appears to be a pretty average guy, albeit probably a little overworked and definitely a bit stressed out from being a single father trying to raise his daughter, Sarah. Unfortunately for Joel, this is about as happy as we get to see him for most of the game, because it isn't long after we pick up his story that a viral outbreak begins to spread across America, and society begins to quickly collapse around him and his daughter. This ultimately leads to Sarah being shot and killed in front of him. Now we haven't even made it out of the prologue yet, and we've already run into the first technique I want to take a closer look at, and that's perspective. Although Joel will be the main character for most of the game, he isn't actually the character we start out controlling. That particular honor goes to his daughter Sarah. If you watched my video about Shadow of the Colossus, then you've already heard me talk at length about the inherent bias we have as a player towards the characters we inhabit in games, usually causing us to see them in a more charitable light. That being said, I don't think the developer Naughty Dog chose to have us start the game of Sarah to give us a less subjective view of Joel. Because even through Sarah's eyes, Joel appears to be every bit the hero we would assume him to be if we were playing as him. Instead, I think this decision serves a more basic function, and that is to give us both a more vulnerable perspective as the world starts to fall into chaos around us, and to bolster the impact of Sarah's eventual death at the end of the prologue. There will be a lot more to go over pertaining to perspective later in the game, but for now, let's just continue with the story. From here, we pick back up with Joel 20 years in the future, and we see just how much he and the world have changed in that time. Sarah's death has had a profound negative impact on him, one which saw him change into a grizzled and callous survivor with few cares left in the world. After a gun trade deal goes bad, Joel and his partner Tess find themselves accepting a job from the Fireflies, a group of rebels trying to fight back against the martial law of the current establishment. 
Their mission is to escort a 14-year-old girl named Ellie to a larger group of fireflies who want to use her to create a vaccine for the fungal outbreak. Because as it turns out, Ellie is immune to the virus. Unfortunately for Joel, his luck goes from bad to worse as they soon discover the group of fireflies they were supposed to meet up with have already been found and killed, and Tess ends up dying in the ensuing ambush to buy time for Joel and Ellie to escape. Now just the two of them, our two protagonists set out to try and find a firefly camp that still has equipment needed to extract a cure from Ellie. The growing relationship between Joel and Ellie is really going to be the core that the rest of The Last of Us is built around. Over the course of what is roughly the first two-thirds of the game, these two go from begrudging partners to surrogate father and daughter. This also gives us a chance to see the second technique I want to spotlight, minor interactions. The first specific example I want to go over are the many side conversations between Joel and Ellie that the player can find. Posters are everywhere. I saw this right before the outbreak. You did? Was he totally gutter by the end? <laughs> Nobody gets gutted. It's a it's a dumb teen movie. Who dragged you to see it then? I don't know. Let's just stay focused, all right? All right. All of these are optional bits of characterization that are scattered throughout the areas you explore in between combat encounters. Now, these kinds of moments aren't exactly going to make it into a teaser trailer boasting about the game's killer gameplay, but I do think they're interesting examples of how the game often skirts the line between active and passive ways of involving the player in the story. It isn't required that you find any of these scenes to progress in the game, and thus that means none of them can have a larger impact on the story. Uncovering a certain amount of these moments doesn't unlock a new branch of the narrative, and it doesn't noticeably change the personalities of Joel or Ellie. But because I have to make an honest effort to find these scenes, I get to take some ownership over them as a player, and I become at least a little bit more invested in seeing these characters develop. While I may not be able to affect who the characters become, I do get to better understand them as the people they already are, and to me that's just as important. Another frequently used example of minor interaction are the many teamwork sections, where Joel will, for example, boost Ellie up to a high ledge to grab a ladder, or open a vent so she can crawl through to a locked area on the other side. These can be as simple as one button press and rarely serve any real challenge, and they can even be as inconsequential as just giving Ellie a high five. But even if it's only in a small way, they do build a connection between the player and the characters through gameplay. They're simple yet effective. Although I will also admit, the impact of these moments can be slightly lessened by the fact that they are overused from time to time. I'm not a game designer, but my best guess here is that some of these instances are used to also hide the game loading in the next area of the level, which is an unfortunate reality of technical limitations, but is still nonetheless distracting. There are two more moments of minor interaction I want to touch on and they're very specifically about conveying emotion to the player through gameplay. The first one comes about halfway through Joel and Ellie's adventure. After procuring a truck, the two make their way to a dilapidated Pittsburgh, where they're quickly ensnared by a bandit trap. While trying to escape the surprise attack, Joel crashes their vehicle, and the two are each pulled from the truck and quickly find themselves in a fight for their lives. Up until this point, the scene has played out entirely in a cinematic, but once the fighting begins, the game enters a quick time event where the player has to rapidly press the square button to save Joel from being impaled on a broken piece of glass. Joel wrestles his way out of the grasp of his assailant and instead throws him upon the broken glass. Now free, Joel can rush to save Ellie, except now the player is the one that has to move Joel over to her. Joel kicks the raider off Ellie and proceeds to repeatedly bash his face into the side of a desk. We then transition into a fairly standard combat scenario. Once again, there's no rigorous button combination needed to save Ellie. You literally just move Joel from point A to point B. It takes all about 5 seconds. All in all, it's a very brief transition from a cutscene to gameplay, but when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to be conscious of the fact that at times you're in control and other times you aren't. Heck, the footage you're watching right now is from my most recent playthrough, which is probably the 5th or 6th time I've played this game to completion, and yet I'm still struggling to make it through this fight. I breeze through most of the other combat section in the game, but I'm still noticeably affected by how emotionally charged that last scene was. In fact, I'm always amazed when I go back and watch this particular transition. I'm shocked by how it's actually less violent than I remembered it. In my mind, there's always a bigger spray of blood when Joel throws that raider onto the glass, or there's a few extra times he rams this guy's head into the counter, which I think says a lot about how the interactivity of this scene is able to translate such a high level of intensity to the player. For the next scene, we need to jump forward a bit in the story. By now, Joel and Ellie have been pretty firmly established as partners. They may not have reached full-on surrogate father-daughter status yet, but they have definitely developed a bond of mutual trust for one another. At this point, they've made it to an abandoned college campus where the Fireflies are believed to be stationed. 
To their dismay, the two discover that the lab that was serving as their base of operations has been abandoned for months, and soon things get even worse as they're attacked by yet another group of bandits. The action starts to play out like every other enemy encounter in the game up until this point, but all of a sudden, things start to go bad. Like, real bad. Like, Joel gets impaled by a piece of rebar bad. From here, things start to play out a lot differently than they usually do. Everything that used to be so simple, like vaulting over debris or even aiming a gun, are now laborious actions for Joel. All the button presses are the same, but the results are now very different. Although you start out with far more control of Joel than you do in the Pittsburgh ambush, by the end of this scene, Joel and the player are pretty much helpless and can only sit back and watch. This is the first time Joel has to really rely on Ellie to save him. With both their lives on the line, she gets the job done. Eventually, they make it out of the university alive, but maybe not for long. Joel falls from their horse after going unconscious from the pain of his injuries. The music swells, drowning out Ellie's pleas for Joel to get up, and the screen suddenly cuts to black. This is probably my favorite sequence in the entire game. Much like the previous scene, when you go back and break down when exactly the player does and doesn't have control, it can seem really mechanical, but in context, it's so impressive how seamlessly every beat is stitched together. It's just an all-around fantastic audio-visual experience, as the sound begins cutting in and out around you, and your vision starts to blur and colors distort. It really conveys a sense of desperation in a way a cutscene just couldn't, at least not to the same degree. Now that we've covered a few ways The Last of Us uses interaction to enhance its story, I think it's about time we address the elephant in the room, and that's the use of cutscenes. So in film, there's sort of an unwritten rule known as show don't tell, which basically means since a film is a visual medium, whenever it's possible to convey a piece of information visually instead of having a character just say it, you should choose the visual option. So if we were to try and extrapolate this to games, that rule would be something like play don't show. But in either case, I think this rule gets misinterpreted as an ultimatum instead of a suggestion. It doesn't mean film should never use dialogue to tell its audience something, just that it should only do so when there's no other option. And I think the same should be true for games. Despite its reputation, I feel confident in saying, on most accounts, The Last of Us never really goes into full-on cutscene mode unless it absolutely has to. And these situations can usually be broken down into two sections. Either dialogue scenes where the developer wants the camera control to emphasize things like facial expressions and body language, things that would otherwise be very hard to draw attention to through gameplay, or short action sequences where they want better control to direct the scene's pace and visual flow. To give us an example, there's one cutscene in particular I want to point out, but it also means we're going to have to go a little further back in the story. This scene takes place right after Ellie runs away from Joel once she discovers he's trying to pawn her off to his brother Tommy out of fear that he's getting too attached to her. Boys, movies, deciding which shirt goes with which skirt. It's bizarre. Get up. We're leaving. Mm. And if I say no? Do you even realize what your life means? Huh? Running off like that, putting yourself at risk? It's pretty goddamn stupid. Well, I guess we're both disappointed with each other then. What do you want from me? Admit that you wanted to get rid of me the whole time. Tommy knows this area. Oh, better fuck. Than... Well, I'm sorry. I trust him better than I trust myself. Stop with the bullshit. What are you so afraid of? That I'm going to end up like Sam? I can't get infected. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. Not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And... You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. You're right. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. And we are going our separate ways. Get it together. We're not alone. 
This point in the story serves as a sort of emotional fulcrum for Joel and Ellie's relationship. This is the moment where they're both at their most raw, and while it doesn't exactly end on a high note for their relationship, it's not long after this that they both set aside their respective insecurities and fully embrace the bond that's naturally forming between them. This exchange also has just about everything you could want from a good cutscene. Spectacular acting by the motion capture performers, high quality animation to accentuate those performances, and strong direction to lead the viewer through the scene. Personally, I can't conceive of any way this scene would be made better if it were interactive. Inserting button prompts or giving me control over the camera are only going to distract from all the things the scene does right. So should The Last of Us be penalized for using cutscenes that, yes, aren't interactive, but portray things that would be much harder to convey through gameplay? By now, this probably won't be a surprise to anyone, but I would say no. To me, this is a perfect example of how games can be so special and unique by combining inactive with interactive. Of course, this is an example of a very intimate moment between characters, but you could still make the argument that the handful of action moments that are inactive cutscenes are still largely unnecessary. While I won't argue that from a technical perspective this is true, overall these scenes don't bother me because they're infrequent enough and they often serve as a capstone at the end of a portion of gameplay instead of existing in lieu of having the player involved in the action at all. Okay, so now that we've finally addressed the most common complaint about The Last of Us, we need to wrap back around and finish talking about the thing I brought up all the way in the beginning of this video, and that's perspective. Which is also convenient timing because this allows us to pick right back up where we left off. The next thing we see after witnessing what could very well have been Joel's death is Ellie hunting a rabbit alone in a snowy forest. The player character has now shifted yet again, this time from Joel to Ellie. Obviously one of the biggest reasons for this switchover is that it adds merit to the speculation most players will probably have at this point that Joel is indeed dead. But the game doesn't really dangle that carrot for all that long. After a short hunting sequence where Ellie manages to kill a large deer, she runs into two strangers. What starts as a standoff eventually morphs into a trade and a tenuous alliance, as Ellie agrees to give the strangers her kill in exchange for something she needs. When they ask her what she wants in return, she quickly replies, Medicine. You have any antibiotics? Which tips us off that Joel is more than likely still alive. And in the very next scene, it is revealed that Joel has in fact survived the attack at the university. And yet we still go on to play as Ellie for a significant chunk of time. So if having us play as Ellie two-thirds of the way through the game isn't really meant to be a twist that makes us believe Joel is dead, then what's the reason for this decision in the first place? Well, as before, I think there are a few answers here. First off, just like the prologue, I don't think the developers are giving us control of Ellie to subvert any sort of assumptions we might have about her. Even as a non-playable character, Ellie has easily been the most relatable character in the game. But what this changeover does do is it allows us to see Ellie for the first time away from Joel, Something that obviously wouldn't be possible if Joel were the only character we ever played as. Without Joel there to help her anymore, Ellie now has to fully fend for herself, and she turns out to be more than capable of it. After the trade with the two men goes bad, Ellie ends up getting captured, and because that wouldn't be bad enough, she also quickly learns that the group that captured her just so happened to be cannibals. Despite all this, she manages to escape from the cell she's being kept in, make her way through a town besieged by a blizzard and full of armed men trying to hunt her down, and ultimately subdues and kills David, her abductor. And she does all of this without any help from Joel. In fact, this act is broken up by a few sections where we once again get to play as Joel, now in pursuit of Ellie, but he doesn't actually reach her until after she's already killed David. Now, it's debatable whether actually killing David is a net positive for Ellie as a person, as she pretty mercilessly hacks his face to pieces with a machete, which, you know, is not the best thing for a 14-year-old to have to go through. But at least narratively speaking, this is an impactful change for her as a character, and it's something that we wouldn't be able to see if we were only playing as Joel. And there's also the fact that, just like with Sarah, getting to play as Ellie is going to strengthen our bond with her just a little bit more, and that's about to be very important as we get to the end of the game. With David and his henchmen dealt with, our two protagonists are now free to head towards what will ultimately end up being the climax of the game. They finally make their way to Salt Lake City where they once again hope to find a Firefly base. After narrowly escaping from a flooded subway tunnel, Joel and Ellie are rescued by some patrolling fireflies, but not before both of them lose consciousness, Ellie from almost drowning and Joel after being hit with the butt of a gun belonging to a firefly. Joel wakes up next to Marlene and learns that Ellie is alive but still unconscious, and is already being prepped for a surgery to extract a cure from her brain tissue. Marlene also informs him that the operation will prove fatal for Ellie, and as you would imagine, Joel's not a big fan of this plan. 
so he proceeds to murder his way through an entire hospital of fireflies until we finally make it back here, to this operating room. Sweet Jesus. Doctor? What are you doing in here? I won't let you take her. This is our... Don't come any closer. I mean it. To anyone who's ever asked, why isn't The Last of Us just a movie, this is your answer. Well, everything we've gone over up until this point could also be your answer, but if I have to be overly reductive and boil it down to just one moment, then it's this scene right here. This easily could have just been a cutscene, but it's very purposefully not. You have to be the one who pulls the trigger. This scene will not continue until you do so. And this isn't a choice. It's not about getting the good ending or the bad ending, it's just about getting to the ending. The only ending there could ever be. You as the player don't have any agency over this scene because a hundred times out of a hundred times, when Joel enters that operating room, he kills that surgeon. He, at least in his mind, saves Ellie. And Joel is the character we're playing as. We're Joel here. So there's nothing left for us to do except pull the trigger. This is where all the work that went into developing the relationship between Joel and Ellie and the player finally starts to pay off. Because if you're not invested at this moment, if you don't want to save Ellie just as bad as Joel does, then this scene doesn't work, not to its full potential. This is the point behind all those minor interactions, all those perspective changes, and even all those cutscenes, to get you to buy in, to make you care about these characters, and to make you question if they, and by extension you, are really doing the right thing here. And this is only the first half of what makes The Last of Us one of the most divisive endings in video game history. After escaping the hospital with Ellie and killing Marlene in the process, Joel eventually decides to lie to Ellie about what happened with the Fireflies, and tells her they weren't able to derive a cure from her. After some time, Joel and Ellie reach the settlement Joel's brother Tommy has established, and the game switches back to giving us control of Ellie instead of Joel. And this is finally where I can make good on the point I originally made all the way back in the prologue, and that is that it's very important that we're not playing as Joel here. Now that we aren't controlling him, we can observe Joel free from the inherent bias that comes with playing as the character. And what we see is someone who we can no longer recognize as a selfless or heroic person, instead is actually someone who is rather weak and selfish. While he's happier than we've ever seen him, now openly bringing up Sarah and telling Ellie how much she would have liked her, we also know what that happiness cost him, and more importantly, we know what that happiness cost Ellie. She's still visibly sullen and unable to come to terms with the fact that, even after everything she's been through, she still failed to find a cure for the infection. She failed at what she had come to accept as her destiny. It's a real emotional low point for both Ellie and the player. Before going any further, Ellie stops Joel and demands he tell her one last time that he's telling the truth about the Fireflies. I know that's not what you want to hear right now. Swear to me. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. I swear. The somewhat open-ended nature of this ending means that players are going to have a lot of different opinions about how good or bad Joel is. But whether you think he's a morally complicated anti-hero, or just a straight-up villain, it's hard to see him as the altruistic hero we may have assumed him to be at the beginning of the game. So up until now, this video has been pretty effusively positive about The Last of Us. But that doesn't mean I think it's perfect. The moments of interaction I pointed out earlier are admittedly a fairly small chunk of the total time you'll actually spend playing The Last of Us. And while there are certain things I like about the core gameplay, namely the combat, I do agree with many critics that it's largely overused. All of the good that the combat does to add to the mood and dire tone of the world is ultimately undercut by all the times an action sequence feels like it was squeezed in just because we've gone too long without actually firing a gun. Ideally, I would have liked to see them break even further away from the mold of what we think of as a contemporary action game. I wish they were more okay with having even longer sections where there isn't any real combat. 
where having to pull out a gun and really use it means something because it happens so infrequently. But the reason I bring up these criticisms in the first place is because they're complaints I have with this game specifically, and not the actual style of game that it belongs to. If this style of game isn't your preferred genre, that's perfectly fine. I've never met anyone who liked every type of game, or even every type of movie, book, or music. But there's a reason many people like myself still enjoy this type of game. I still love The Last of Us in spite of all of its shortcomings, because it was able to get me emotionally invested in the story in a way very few games or movies have before, and a crucial part of that is the fact that it is interactive. When you break a game like this down into its component parts, it's easy to make it look like a game that's at war with itself. Taken out of context, this doesn't look like engaging storytelling, and this doesn't look like interesting gameplay. But these are elements that were never meant to stand on their own, or to be sorted onto a binary of story versus gameplay. Their power comes from their ability to enhance one another and make for a stronger experience in the end. The cutscenes and side conversations help me feel more invested in the characters, which in turn makes me more engaged in the combat, which then reinforces the bleak and desperate world these characters live in, and it gives me a small taste of what it's like for these characters to try so hard just to survive for one more day. It's a symbiotic relationship that, when it works right, is like magic. It allows for a certain type of emotional investment that is truly unique to this medium, which, ironically enough, is the exact same thing some of the most ardent critics of The Last of Us are looking for. Games that provide experiences in a way only an interactive medium can. Could The Last of Us be a good movie? Would it still be a good story if it were just something you passively watched? Sure, probably, but I truly believe the story was made better because it was a story I played. It was made better because it was a story that, in a small way, I felt like I got to live. It was a story that was made better because it was a video game. No one knows what it's like to be the bad man to be the sad man behind blue eyes